In this talk, Hakim Bello Osagi, Harvard Business School trained petroleum economist, illustrates how essential African women business leaders are in the development of Africa and points out how to reevaluate risk in emerging markets. A lot of business involves working 24, well, not 24 hours, but certainly 12 hours a day, 18 hours a day. And it is far more difficult for a woman to balance child rearing with the development of such businesses. But I think that that's changing now. And certainly in Nigeria and in Ghana, women are doing many, many more things than they were doing uh, years ago. Traditionally, women have always been involved in the market economy. Traditionally, they've always been involved in the markets. So in one sense, they're working and they're doing business is not a strange thing. Um, I, I know that my grandmother, for example, always had a trading business of her own. And that was 90, 100 years ago. So there was nothing, shall I say, untraditional with her playing that role. Now I think that when you move from a certain agricultural community and you move to an urban environment and a nuclear family, you now have more pervasive issues as to the role of women and the role of men. Um, but the atmosphere, certainly in Nigeria and in Ghana, is one in which there are mothers who quite rightly say to their daughters, you must never be dependent on a man, however good he looks. <laughs> and there are fathers, like myself, who are enormously proud of their daughter's accomplishments and clearly don't believe that any man is good enough for their daughters. <laughs> so in one way or another, the inclusion of women in the business and economic lives of Nigeria is getting larger and larger and larger. 30% of the banks are female. 55% uh, of the judges in Nigeria are female. Half of the medical school classes are female. And I think that's a wonderful thing. Um, I visited um, Harvard Business School recently and I had a discussion with the dean. And I was telling him why I thought that in many respects, the education that we received was, had huge gaps. And that for a lot of people who come from emerging markets, Africa, Latin America, they have to relearn certain things that, no, they have to forget certain things that they are taught during the program, and they have to start afresh. So he said, okay, so, you know, Kim, why do you think that? He was very kind in telling me this. I could see that it was a, quite a lot to stomach if you're the dean of each half business school telling you. <laughs> and I said, look, number one, the way we look at risk, okay? We teach that emerging markets are risky places to go to. And I said that if you look at risk, and you break risk down, okay? There's political risk, technological risk, financial risk, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What is important is the total risk involved. So for example, in the United States, you have low political risk. However, the technological risk in the United States is humongous. You can be a company in the United States and some guy, a high school dropout <laughs> or a university dropper from Harvard, like Bill Gates, can blow you out of the water. And you can find that there are companies that are not in your industry who can make innovations that's 
come into your industry and completely rewrite the history of your industry. And if you look at the companies that were substantial 10, 20, 30 years ago, it is amazing how that list has changed. And it's, that's, not going to, that, that's, that's going to continue to happen. So if I look at Nigeria, I have a higher political risk. But the kinds of needs that I am catering to, a water system, electricity, are not things that have huge technological risk. The first move advantage in an emerging market is much more substantial because there are fewer people who are going to come in there and follow you there. So I said that we need to teach students to see risk in its totality. Because an American is not accustomed to political risk, he elevates that risk as a very huge issue and is nervous about it. But for example, to a Chinese person or an Indian person, political risk is not something that he spends his time worrying about day and night. He's used to it, and therefore he knows how to, to tackle it. So I would say to you that emerging markets, politically, they may be riskier, but if you're in the IT or communications business in the United States, I would say that you're in a far riskier business than I am in the hotel business in Nigeria. Um, he agreed. <laughs> One other, the second thing I said to him, sorry, please. Second thing I said to him, which I think is also important, is this issue I've, I've made about data. And I said that business schools teach students to be obsessive about data. If there's no data, if there's no market study, if there's no market segmentation, you don't move. Did Ford have a market segmentation strategy <laughs> or study? Did he? No. Did Rockefeller have one? No. The fact that you do not have complete information does not mean that the imperative to act, that the opportunities to make money, and that the ability to be very successful disappears. You still proceed ahead. He agreed about that as well. Yeah. <laughs>